Good afternoon, Advanced Kentucky AP Physics teachers and, um, and particularly you students who are taking a little time out from your day to join us um, for our second of our physics content review sessions online. Uh, we hope these will prepare you to um, answer the AP physics questions that you'll see in just about a month. Um, today, once again, we're lucky to have Darren Holt from Great Crossing High School in Scott County. He will be reviewing Newton's laws and dynamics I'm, I'm your host, uh, Lou Acampora, and I know some of you, um, and I hope to meet many more of you. Uh, in terms of meeting etiquette, please, just a reminder, um, make sure you're muted and your video is turned off, um, but do feel free to participate and use the chat room and the polling option when called for. This session and others will be archived at kyap2020.com, so it's a good resource as you start to prepare for the AP physics exam. Um, so without too much delay here, let's get right on to Darren Holt. We've got a lot to talk about. Darren is a um, high school teacher at Great Crossing High School, teaching advanced placement physics. He's a NIMSI physics consultant. That's a national math and science initiative. Um, and he is also a reader for the AP physics exam. So Darren, I'm gonna turn this over to you. All right. That's not uh, good. That? I need to share my screen, right? You do. All right, did that do it? Looks good. All right. So uh, like Lou said, uh, this will be archived at this website. Also, the pages that you're going to see will be archived at this website. So any of the notes over the dynamics, you can go and download a three page uh, uh, set of these slides uh, in a PDF form that you can go back and review later. So when we go over the notes parts of dynamics, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about it. I'd rather spend our time answering questions. Uh, what I found is these sessions, and at least my presentation, you're better off having your phone uh, rotate a landscape so it makes it a little bit bigger print. Uh, things that you will need, possibly, is some paper, a pencil, and a calculator, right? So in terms of forces, uh, these are the different forces that we would look at. Uh, we, have, we have weight, we have a normal force, right? So a support force by surface. We have tension, uh, a force that's transferred through a uh, cord. We have static friction, we have kinetic friction, and we have a spring force. So those will be the types of forces that we will look at during today's uh, presentation. All right. uh, Newton's three laws. Uh, I've gone into some descriptions of here of why some ways of saying them are better than others. Uh, so I, okay. Um, Newton's first law uh, deals with an object or objects, whether it's a one object system or a multiple object system whose external forces all add up to zero. Uh, if there is no net force on an object, then the object moves with constant velocity. What that means basically is it is either sitting still or it is moving at a constant speed, right? In a straight line. And that would be Newton's first law. Newton's second law, Right, Newton's second law deals with uh, when a system or a system of a single object or many object that the forces don't add up to zero, right? And when this happens, the object is going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. Now, instead of, and if you're asked to write about something, a scenario on your exam, where you have to apply Newton's second law. If you just said F equals MA, you're saying that A force is equal to mass times acceleration. Whereas Newton's second law actually says the object's acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional, proportional to the mass. So that goes to the formula and I copy and pasted this straight off the formula sheet on the exam, right? Um, a lot of times when you're asked about questions with Newton's second law or at least conceptual questions, which you could expect to see on this exam, uh, you have to analyze 
um, what effect some change has on um, the acceleration. So if you use the formula the way it's written on the formula sheet, it leads into discussing that acceleration. Newton's third law is something that a lot of kids get confused about. And uh, they think about, you know, there's two forces. And sometimes they try to apply the two forces in a Newton's third law pair on the same object. So what's important for you to understand here is that Newton's third law is this smiley face statement that says, if A exerts object A, exerts a force on object B, then object B exerts a force on object A that is equal in strength and opposite in direction, right? So just talking about action and reaction doesn't really explain what you're really trying to say. It is important that you focus on two completely separate objects and that the force of object A on B is the same as the force of B on A, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Right, defining systems, and we're going to talk about systems that today that have only one object in them. And we're going to look at systems that could have more than one object in it. And even if a system has more than one object, you may only want to look at one of the objects in that system. Right, so when you do your analysis, you may only want to choose one of the objects, right? Uh, it is important that if you're writing about some kind of a scenario that you'd clearly define what you are studying, right? It's, it's extremely important that you define that this is, these are the objects that are in the system that I'm studying and then go about your discussion. Uh, a force is considered to be internal, right? To a system, if the object of the force, which is the thing that is receiving the force. So the thing that is receiving the force is in the system and the object that is applying the force is in the system. If both of these things are true, if both objects, the one that's applying the force and the one that's receiving the force are inside of your defined system, that is an internal force. If a force is only external, if the object that is receiving the force is in the system and the thing that is applying the object, I'm sorry, applying the force to the object is outside of the system. And why this is very important is there are many statements in physics where you're talking about the impact of external forces on whether it's motion, energy, or momentum, right? So it's important that you can clearly define and understand what internal and external are. Free body di diagrams, rules for drawing free body diagrams. And I, I wouldn't expect that if your exam is going to be online and you should be able to write everything in text, that you would actually be drawing free body diagrams. I would think more likely you'd be given a scenario and some choices of which one of these free body diagrams best models the situation. And if that's the case, these rules should be applied that all forces are drawn as arrows that are emitting from the center of mass in the direction the force is applied, All right. Uh, in most cases, the force arrows will be drawn to scale. In other words, they should be representing their magnitude, right? Uh, a force that is twice as, if force B is twice the, the number of Newtons as force A, it should be drawn twice as long, right? Never put components on a free body diagram and never put centripetal force on a free body diagram, right? So these are general rules for free body diagrams. Rules for using and writing equations from a free body diagram. And this is where a lot of kids struggle, right? So after you have drawn your free body diagram, you'll need to write either one or more equations that relate to the forces by applying Newton's laws, right? If there is a force that is not parallel and not perpendicular to the motion of the object, to the acceleration of the object, break it down into the components. Right? So if the force is basically at an angle, then break it down into the components, both perpendicular and parallel, that go along with the acceleration of the object. Uh, write an equation where forces are perpendicular to the acceleration using Newton's first law. So if you have forces that are perpendicular to the acceleration of the object, then that means those forces are not causing acceleration. 
And if they are not causing acceleration, then it must be Newton's first law because the object in that dimension uh, is not accelerating. So the sum of those forces would be equal to zero. If you have forces that are parallel to the acceleration, then you would write the equation using Newton's second law. So the sum of the force would be equal to the mass times the acceleration, right? So that's when you would apply Newton's second law. Uh, that's when you apply Newton's first law. You would then combine these equations and other given information, right, of forces, like saying that gravity is equal to mg or friction is equal to mu normal in order to answer the question that you were given, right? So these are some basic notes over how to apply uh, forces and Newton's first and second law equations to answer questions on your exam. So here is our first question, right? And uh, we're gonna get a, a poll pulled up. And what I'll do is I'll ask you some different questions and most of them will be multiple choice. And you'll get a poll polling box that will come up on your screen that if it's in your way, you can move it to read the question. And then you'll select your answer and mark it. So this is our first uh, polling question. Please try, take a minute or so and try to answer this question. And we've got about 60% of the participants responding. Feel free to jump in here and then I'll give you a few more seconds. And three, and teachers can vote too. Let's get you in there and you don't have to vote accurately. There we go. All right, so don't feel bad if you get tricked. I guess trick may not be the right phrase, but if you miss some of these uh, these questions don't feel bad they are designed that if you have a misconception to identify your misconception right so we basically have even from b c and d all right so let's see here it says the tractor and box must either be at rest or moving with a constant velocity right so what i'm thinking here is that you're thinking that you have equal and opposite forces right so it says that you've got a heavy tractor it says uh, the force at which the box pushes on the tractor is equal to the force of the tractor on the box, right? The tractor in the box must be moving at a constant velocity. So again here, I think you're trying to apply that you're gonna have equal and opposite forces. But remember, these are two different forces from two different objects on each other. So the heavy tractor force pushes the light box and the light box pushes the heavy tractor. So this object, the tractor, pushes the box, and the box, in turn, pushes back on the tractor. And this says, uh, when must be, they be equal? And since it's two different objects interacting, the force of the tractor pushing the box must always, under all conditions, be equal to the force of the box pushing back on the tractor. This is a statement of Newton's third law. So these two forces will always be equal in magnitude under all conditions, right? And Darren, can I interrupt for just yes, a second? Yes, certainly. But um, you know, Newton's first law says that really physics is the same whether you're at rest or moving with a constant velocity. So, and there would be, I can imagine almost no, no circumstance in which if A is true, B and C would not also be true. Because A, B, and C are really, I mean, at rest is really just a, a particular instant of a constant velocity of zero. So since if there's only one correct answer, it has to be D. And I, um, this is a little bit of, of 
you know, testmanship to understand that. But um, remember, at rest and constant velocity in terms of forces are really indistinguishable. Right. So hopefully, uh, you, you'll, you'll get that, you'll understand that a little bit better if that were to show up on your exam, right? Here's a second question, and this one is dealing with choosing the correct free body diagram, right? So again, take a minute or so, analyze this scenario, and try to choose which one of these free body diagrams best represents the scenario. And it looks like most people are voting, so we'll give you about five more seconds for the last stragglers. And three, two, one. There we go. All right. So I really, you know, this is a good review session, and this is a good question to help many of us. And I, I like that most of us weren't tricked by C or D or we didn't select these because we should understand that the normal force is always perpendicular to the plane or the surface in which the object is in contact. So since the, looks like a police car, it says car, but it looks like a police car, is in contact with this inclined plane, then the normal force must be perpendicular to that. So that eliminates C and D as possible correct answers because these normal forces are not perpendicular to the plane. Right, which means it must be either A or B, which the majority of us chose. And every one of the objects gives you that the weight is acting straight down. So that's good. So then it becomes which of these scenarios must be the same. All right. The majority of us chose B. And from my experience of using this question, most students select this one by thinking that the car is moving up the incline plane. So the friction must be acting down the incline plane because the friction opposes motion, right? And they say, when asked, why did you select this one and where does force F come from? They say, well, that's the force of the car or that's the applied force. But there's no force. Well, there is a force of the car in this scenario. The car is applying a force to a different object. So if you imagine the motor in here running, it's going to be tr applying some torque to an axle. It's going to try to make these wheels spin in a circle. So I'm going to grab me a circle here and try to explain here on the screen, right? So this tire is going to try to move in this direction, right? That tire, as the car goes up the hill is going to try to move in that direction. So that's the way the wheel is going to try to rotate. And what happens is as this wheel tries to rotate, it is going to push the ground. It is going to push the ground down the hill. The tire pushes the ground down the hill. And unless your tires are spinning, like slipping, right? Uh, then you're undergoing static friction. So this tire is using the static friction or, or sometimes in this scenario referred to as traction. And it is put, the wheel is pushing the ground down the hill. In turn, in turn, the frictional force is pushing, since the tire is trying to go down the hill, the friction acts up the hill, which makes the correct free body diagram choice A. All right, so I'll try that again. The tires are trying to rotate down the hill. So the friction is opposing the motion of the tires spinning down the hill, and thus it's going to apply a force up the hill, which causes the car to climb the hill. It's no different than if you were trying to walk outside uh, by a swimming pool on the concrete. You push backwards on the 
cement, and then the ground with all the traction from like the concrete around a pool pushes you forward. So it's friction that propels you forward. Propulsion through walking is, is caused by static friction. Uh, this is the same scenario. The car's trying to push the car, the car's trying to push the hill backwards, so the hill pushes the car forwards. Uh, where the words for friction, where a lot of kids understand kinetic friction, I want you to try to strike that from your memories and think of it as sliding friction. In other words, slipping. If you were then going to try to walk, you know, two days ago in that terrible snowstorm that we had, and uh, the ground was obviously covered in ice, uh, you have less friction. And without friction, you have slipping, right? So instead of thinking of it as kinetic friction, think of it as slipping or sliding friction, right? So if the case isn't sliding, then it must be undergoing static friction, right? So that's this one. And uh, it sounds like we need to have, at least I need to give you a little bit there because we had a lot of misconceptions about this scenario. All right, here is a, another question. Please try to uh, solve it. And those of you with a pencil and paper might be well served by sketching a little free body diagram here. And we'll take a few more seconds to look at this. All right. All right, uh, I like that. Uh, the majority of us got this one. Uh, I'm going to go through in a quicker mode here how to uh, to set this up. Here's the free body diagram I drew for this. Uh, the weight of the parachute and skydiver is acting downward and the air resistance is acting upward, right? So weight is equal to mg. So instead of just leaving this as 1.4w, I'm going to call this 1.4mg. I'm just going to call this one mg, right? Uh, and I guess it doesn't really matter which way you define as positive or negative. Normally what I would say is because the skydiver is falling, that direction is positive, right? So for me, I would say that the sum of my forces is equal to MA. And how I know it's going to be accelerating is that the forces are not equal in magnitude, right? In that case, MG is a positive force because it's in the direction of positive motion. So MG minus. And 1.4 mg is going to be a negative force because it's opposite of the direction of positive. So it's going to be minus 1.4 mg, and that's going to be equal to ma. Uh, mg minus 1.4 mg is negative 0 0.4 mg. Divide both sides by m, and you get that the acceleration is negative 0.4 times g, which is negative 4. And since positive is down, negative means up. So the correct answer on that one should be four meters per second squared upward. And that was choice 
Let's see. And so that's straight applying Newton's second law. Uh, I guess a little leeway in here. One of the types of questions that you would be asked to apply on the exam, uh, there are two types of questions. One is called a, uh, a qualitative quantitative uh, translation question where you'll have to look at multiple representations of a scenario. Uh, you will also be asked to write a paragraph. Those are the two types of questions. So I've tried to incorporate uh, multiple questions on this particular problem scenario that go along with that format. So the next four questions or so are going to deal with this scenario. So uh, please try to answer this one first. For those wondering out there, these polls are completely anonymous and we are not saving your answers. Don't be afraid to ask questions or to just identify misconceptions. Got a few more votes coming in, and that's most of them. So I'm going to end the polling in three, two, one. All right. Uh, I, I like this. Uh, uh, you guys did a good job. We did a good job as a group in selecting the correct free body diagram. Uh, the one rule that some of us forgot and applied when we shouldn't is that you never put components on a free body diagram. And what you have here in part C and part D is you have the, that this component of tension is broken down into its, or that this tension is broken down into its components. Obviously these both can't be correct because of trig. One of these is gonna be correct, but uh, you never put the components on your free body diagram. So that means that our best choice, our best free body diagram choice is going to be choice B. Right, so our choice here for the free body diagram of this scenario is choice B. Right, so what I've done for the next one is I've taken this free body diagram that we've we've answered, and I've just copy and pasted it over here to go with this particular question. Now, on the qualitative quantitative question, uh, you could be asked to derive an equation right? Or derive an expression, right? So that is what I've tried to do here is to give you choices for a derived expression, right? So take a few minutes. Uh, actually, this may take a couple of minutes to try to come up with which one of these particular um, equations is the most appropriate for this question.
and while you're working on the typical or this particular question, you would get uh, to answer about four different parts. Uh, typically, uh, there's about four parts to these things and maybe like multiple parts to some of them, but you get 25 minutes to answer the qualitative quantitative question. We're coming up on two minutes, so I'll give you a few more seconds. And three, two, one, and let's see how we did. All right. Uh, the majority of us did not select the correct answer. And uh, I understand why. And I'm going to try to do my best to walk you all through using rules applying to uh, to break down and write equations for uh, Newton's laws for this scenario. So I'm going back over to here. And this was our answer to the last one. Here's our actual free body diagram. But then when you write the equations, you can't use this free body diagram to write the equations. You have to break it down into its components, right? You have to break this thing down into its components. So you need these components, right? You need this, this one over here, then this would be the vertical component of the tension force, right? Which is what a lot of us didn't look at in this particular question. Since the angle is here and that side is opposite. Since that side is opposite, the opposite trig function is sine. So opposite and hypotenuse. And again, when we say the force of tension is here, we're really saying that that's the force of tension. If we want this opposite side, opposite over hypotenuse is sine. So this force of tension in the y direction is equal to the force of tension times the sine of the angle, right? So that vertical component is the force of tension times the sine of the angle. This horizontal component, this is the side that is adjacent to the angle and adjacent and hypotenuse is cosine. So that means that the force of tension in the x component is going to be equal to the force of tension times the cosine of your angle. So that's those broken down into those components. So actually what we would want to look at is more of one of those choices that we had in our multiple choice, which would be these forces. drawn like this. All right, then you have to decide and you say that for this particular problem, the acceleration is in that direction. That's the direction of acceleration. And since these forces that are vertical are at right angles to this, these forces must be Newton's first law, which means that the sum of the force in that y direction must be equal to zero. And since these forces are parallel to the acceleration of the object, then these forces must be equal to mass times acceleration, right? Then you go back and you define positives and negatives and you plug in. So for me, since I'm just going to say up is positive and down is negative, so the normal force plus the force of tension times the sine of the angle, minus mg, because that's opposite of my positive definition, is equal to zero. Then over here, I'm just going to say that the force of tension times the cosine of theta minus the force of friction is equal to zero. Then I'm going to look at this particular scenario, this particular problem, and I'm going to make substitutions of equations that I know from <laughs> physics, right? I'm going to substitute in some things that I know from physics. And there is no formula for normal force, right? And there is no necessarily given formula for tension. 
there is no given formula for tension, but there is a given formula for friction. So I'm going to rewrite this and say that the force of tension times the cosine of the angle minus mu times the force of the normal is equal to, sorry, this is MA, is equal to MA. And the question is asking me to solve for acceleration over here, which means I really need to be working on this side. And I'm solving for this, but if I look at my choices, so I'm looking at these, and if I go back and I look at my choices, the force of tension is in every single one of these choices, but not a single one of them has force of friction and not a single one of them has normal force. So that means I'm trying to get rid of the normal force in my expression. So going back over here, that means I need to get rid of this normal force. That's where I can come back to this equation and solve it for the normal force. So the normal force is equal to, and I'm gonna move this mg across the equal sign and make it a positive from a negative to a positive. I'm gonna take this force of tension times the sine of theta and move it across and make it negative. And now I have a normal force here that I can substitute for the normal force there. And when you do that, you get, I'm just going to re move this MA to the, to, the, to the left side. MA equals the force of tension times the cosine of the angle minus mu times mg minus f sine theta. Then to get acceleration by itself, divide both sides by m. Right. And let's see what we've got. Uh, it looks like that corresponds directly with choice D. So our choice there should have been choice D, right? Um, why did I choose? Why did I choose to put in specifically A and B, right? Because I can see clearly what y'all were thinking, that you were thinking that this is the friction, that that's the equation I've always used for friction, and that mg is always equal to my normal force, unless there's another force that's acting in the vertical direction that is changing that normal force. And I guess one way to look at this is that's right there. If you look in that parentheses, that's our normal force, right? So we've got gravity that's applied down, which normally we think that mg then would be the normal force that has to support that weight. But you're lifting upward. You're lifting upward with this tension. And since you're lifting upward with that tension, that's why that minus sign comes in. It's going to reduce the amount of force into the plane, which is going to decrease how much support that it needs from the surface. And since the up component is sine, that makes it this particular uh, expression. So I've tried to explain that through the math, which can be, a, I'm not going, no, there's no doubt about it. It's a little complicated. Uh, it's tough, but I've also tried to explain to you like in terms of conceptually, how you know this would happen. Now, if you were like pushing a broom, right? And you were pushing down into the plane with this, the handle of a broom, like a push broom, then that would make your normal force increase, right? Uh, another scenario where you would have to not have a normal force equal to mg is let's say you had a box that was sitting on an inclined plane, right? Say you had a box sitting on an inclined plane. Come on. Like that. And then your normal force, your, your gravity, your weight would still be acting straight down. And the normal force, which acts perpendicular to that, that normal force, if I can get it kind of normal, uh, that would be equal to mg times the cosine of your angle. And the component of gravity that acts down the inclined plane would be mg times the sine of that angle, right? So that might be something really important to go back and look at, um, to review, uh, to have in your notes, to be prepared 
for when you take your uh, exam. So if you have a box sitting on an inclined plane, you've got mg acting down, and let's say there's no friction, then that's the only force uh, acting. This component of the gravity, if you broke it down into components, this would not be part of the actual free body diagram. That's mg sine theta. And the normal force, which actually acts up, but that normal force is equal to mg times the cosine of theta. So that's if you break this down into components like that. Next question, still with this same scenario, just put just pull in a box, right? With a string at an angle, at a constant angle. Please take a, a minute and a half or so to think through uh, this particular question. And that looks good. We've got a few more seconds for people to vote. Poll and three, two, there we go. All right, uh, I like this, All right? And, and sometimes on these types of questions, uh, honestly, uh, this is gonna be turn into the paragraph question. All right, so I'm still going to talk to you again this time about how the paragraph should be set up. Uh, you might be given an option like this where you have to decide, and sometimes this, selecting the correct one of these, will be worth points. Sometimes it's not worth points. Right? It just depends upon how much, honestly, how much work it takes to get from uh, your given to your conclusion. But for this particular scenario, the correct answer is equal to. And what I tried to explain to you, and if you were with me last week, I tried to do the best I could to explain to you that when you read this, they're asking you to compare the, wow, that was bad. I tried to get fancy. The acceleration of this new scenario, how does that compare to the acceleration of the original experiment. So when you are asked this, the first thing I want you to think about is how do I find this acceleration? And if you go back to that, that question right here, we figured out how to find the acceleration. Not only that, if we keep scrolling back here a minute, we're going to find out that our formula for acceleration, bam, is right there. You need to talk about in your paragraph how these changes affect the net force and how these changes affect the mass and then connect those two ideas to say because of that this is how it's going to affect the acceleration so we're applying newton's second law to this scenario and if i can zip back over here a lot quicker to this so we've doubled the mass and we've doubled the tension All right so here I'm going to try, right? And I'm going to try to make some statements on here uh, that I know, right? So just like I did last week, uh, I asked for you guys to try to come up with some ideas of what are some things you should talk about, bullets you should add to your statement. So we've doubled this tension force and we've doubled this mass, 
right? So what you have to decide is how does doubling this affect anything from what we talked about with the acceleration before and how does doubling that affect anything with what we talked about before, right? Uh, so I'll give you a minute or so, and this is where you might use the chat box that if you can think of something like some statement because of this, you know, something else changes, please type it in there. And I think, yeah, I made it nice and pretty. So here's our picture. It says now to explain using a coherent paragraph length explanation that contains equations or drawings, right? Anyone have any ideas? Chat's got. I like your hints, Lou. All right. So again, if you think back, and I, I don't want to leave you struggling here, and we're moving up to the point where you know uh, we've been together for a while. Uh, the question is about acceleration, right? And we've doubled this mass, and we've doubled this force. And we should know that acceleration is equal to the sum of the force divided by the mass, right? And we should also know that our box is accelerating in that direction, right? So what forces are acting in that direction? Anyone got an answer for that? What forces act in the plane it parallel to the acceleration? Okay, I see an answer here from Ashton that he says that the force doubles, right? But let's be clear that when we looked at this free body diagram, right, if we looked at this free body diagram, this one right here, right? And if you look at Newton's second law right here, that says the sum of the forces, so you don't just have to take into account one force. You have to talk about every force that is in that direction. And the forces that are in that direction are this horizontal component of tension. And what determines that? The tension and the angle. But the angle stayed the same. So one statement that you might say is, since the angle is the same and the tension doubled. Since those two things are true, that means the horizontal component of tension doubled. All right. And if you want to throw in the, how do we calculate that? The horizontal component of tension would, would now be two times the force of tension times the uh, tension in the X would now be two times the force of tension times the cosine of the angle. Right? The other force that's acting in the direction of motion is friction. Right? And if we go back and we look at this nasty O expression, right? We could say that the weight of the box, that's the weight, mg is the weight, the weight of the box doubled. So because mass doubled, The weight doubled. Right? 
that's a statement that should be in your paragraph. Not only that, the tension that's in the vertical direction, which affects the normal force. Since the tension doubled, the vertical component component of tension doubled. Then, because both the, the weight and the vertical component of tension doubled, that means that the normal force has doubled. Since tension And the, since the Y component of tension and the weight doubled, the normal force doubled. So I'm going back again and I'm going to look at my equation. If this number right here has a two stuck in front of it, and this letter right here has a number has a two stuck in front of it, then this whole expression has been multiplied by two. And that's what this statement right there is saying. So we're saying that if you double the mass, the weight doubles. If you double the tension, then this vertical component of tension doubles. And if both of these double, the normal force doubles, right? If the normal force doubles, friction doubles, right? So this whole piece right here, is friction. That whole piece right there is friction. And we've already said that this piece doubled. So the first statement was saying that the, the horizontal component doubled. Well, if the horizontal component doubled and the friction doubled, then both of these parts were multiplied by two, which means that the net force also doubles. So we're now to this statement, which is saying that the horizontal component, right? These statements all go together just to say that the, the friction doubles. But where you really have to focus on is that that net force, the net force has to be the thing that doubles here. So when you talk about the force doubles, it's the net force that doubles. And the net force is composed of multiple pieces right? So it's kind of like you have to think about where did it come from? And not only that, but when you're writing these paragraph questions, the paragraph question is usually relating to something you've already developed an expression for. So like part A may be write the expression, and then part B would be write the paragraph to explain gets bigger, gets smaller, stays the same. So Always go back and focus on and look at your derived equation that you had in part A and how that relates to what you're saying. If the normal, if sorry, if the net force doubles, so if the sum of the force doubled and the mass doubled, and the equation is acceleration is equal to the sum of the force divided by the mass. Well, if this doubles and that doubles, the acceleration is constant. Right. So if you look at this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it took seven individual statements which would mean that the little checkbox of bigger, less than, or more 
may not be worth anything. And these would be the seven points that would be on your paragraph. So those would be the seven points that you would need to write about to get credit for your paragraph. Right, so it's each individual part is usually worth a point. Now, if you were to write a paragraph and you only had, say, four points, like down to four, then usually that would give you a fifth point in that you wrote it in the form of a paragraph. So if it doesn't come out, sometimes it's just, did you write a paragraph? And for AP Physics 1, bulleted statements are equivalent to a paragraph as long as they go logically from the first to the last. Just writing a paragraph doesn't earn a point. You have to make a logical sequence of thought from the beginning of what you're given to the end of your conclusion. And that's how you should, uh, a model for how you should attack a paragraph question. Well, thank you, Darren. I think our time you, is just about up. We've got, you've been a terrific uh, audience out there. And I think there've been some great questions um, that let you practice applying Newton's laws. So uh, we'll sign off now. Uh, thank you students and teachers for being part of this. Again, this is archived. Feel free to email me with any questions. Um, and this, this presentation and notes will be up on the KYAP 2020 website probably by tomorrow. Uh, so stay safe and enjoy, uh, enjoy your time. Thanks so much.